everyone. Oh. Um, so welcome to the second community advisory group meeting for the Clark County Climate Change Planning Project. Uh, my name is Sylvia Chiberski and I'll be facilitating the meeting. And uh, members, you all have your iPads in front of you. Is what we'll be using both for your video so that people can see you and also for the PowerPoint because hour ago, yeah, we're making do. Um, it gets to be difficult to see the iPad, let us know. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll commiserate with you. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be able to see the slides and information well enough there. Um, okay, so I'll just do a little bit of introductory things and then we can dive in. Let's go to the, and, and um, maybe I'll just do a, a mic check. Maria, Maria Verano is our technical support for folks that are online. Can you let me know if you can hear me okay? Hi, Sylvia, loud and clear. Thank you. Great. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, I think maybe two slides actually. We'll work on some of the iPad issues as we kind of dive in here. The introductory slides are not very content heavy, so don't worry if you can't quite see them. Um, so just want to remind people about who the project team is on this slide. So we have Clark County staff. The folks in the room here today are um, Jenna Kay and Gary Albrecht, and then we also have some folks from our um, consultant team. So myself facilitating today, uh, Nicole Matilde is here as our process manager. Maria is our tech support today. Tracy Lunsford is here today too. Um, and then we're also gonna have Dana and Zachary online later on uh, for the resilience sub-element conversation. Next slide. Okay, so we have a few key purposes that we want um, to get through today. Uh, so first, you'll remember at our previous meeting, we introduced the process and engagement plan for the community advisory group. Uh, so we want to go through a few more of those pieces so that you all are aware of your role and some of the expectations of the group. And then we also want to uh, go through the vision statement. So we sent out a survey last, after the last meeting to get your input on um, a vision to guide the climate change element and got your input. So Jenna is going to go through some of that input and share a draft vision statement and get your ideas to help improve that. And then lastly, uh, we're going to start diving deep into the work on the resilience sub-element uh, and discuss climate hazards and impacts, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means then. All right, next slide. Um, this is just our agenda for kind of how we plan to get through those three objectives. We have the group agreements, work plan overview, and vision statement up front, then a break, and then we'll have discussion on the climate hazards and impacts. And that really is the core part of our agenda. So if we need to shorten something up front to make room for it, we'll do that. And then um, we'll have a little bit on this community assets list, which we'll also discuss when we get to that point. And then we'll have some time for public comment, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then we'll wrap up. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so just some um, webinar participation tips. Reminder, if you're a CAG member that's joined by Zoom, you should be in here as a panelist. And if you are a member of the public, then you're joined as an attendee. If for some reason you're a CAG member and you are not joined as a panelist, just please send an email to Maria, and her email address is on the screen here, mverano at kernswest.com. Um, and just a reminder to stay on mute when you're not speaking and join on video if you're able to. And actually this goes for members in the room as well. You have a microphone in front of you. So just press it to speak and then press it right after you speak, and it should turn red. So that's how you know you're off. All right. Perfect. Right, yeah, let's, don't touch the Zoom screen. That microphone we just shouldn't use today. Um, all right, and I'll just keep going for the sake of time to the next slide. 
All right, this is just a reminder about how do you raise your hand in the Zoom platform. Just it's the raise hand button down at the bottom. Uh, if you do need closed captioning, there's also closed captioning that you can turn on for yourself with the CC button at the bottom. Just press that and you'll get closed captioning. Okay, next slide. Okay, and some discuss, uh, discussion guidelines for today, these are the same guidelines we had at our last meeting. We encourage you all to, you know, um, honor the agenda, stay on topic. We want to hear from everyone, so providing a balance of speaking time will be helpful. Uh, we encourage you to bring up your ideas and concerns as early as possible, kind of no surprises at the end, and seek to learn, understand one another's points of view, all the good uh, discussion kind of guidelines that we work with. Great. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I know we do have some members of the public, and we do have a public comment period at the towards the end of today's meeting at around 8:10. Not time certain, but around 8:10. And we're not going to ask for people to make comments now. But if you're a member of the public and you think you want to make a comment, if you raise your hand, we just want to get a sense of who that is, and we'll start making a cue. Um, and you can also just raise your hand later. But there, thanks, Richard. I see you raised your hand. If anyone else would like to, just raise your hand for a few seconds now and we'll note your name down. Um, but we'll, we'll ask for public comment again at 8.10. All right, next slide. I know, Jenna, that you're deep in working in Zoom, but it's almost your turn for updates. Maybe first we'll just go around the room and do a quick hello from all the CAG members. So in a second, I'm going to press mute on my microphone. Um, but I'll go first to Brent, if you just want to say a quick hi. Uh, remember, just press to unmute and then press again to mute. Hello, I'm Brent. And that sounds really loud. <laughs> hi, uh, Nelson Holmberg. Terry Toland. Jessica Brown. Dave Rowe. Noelle Levern. Justin Wood. Great. And I'll go to members on the um, Zoom. Uh, first, I'll go to Donald and then Brian Haberly and then Brian H. This is Don Steinke. Thank you. Sorry about that. I was looking at the wrong screen here. Um, let's go to Elena and then Andrea. Elena, uh, my name is Alana Tudela. Hi, everyone. Andrea Smith. Thank you, and uh, Sharon, and then Ann Foster. Hello, this is Sharon. I'm glad to be here, and hello to everyone. Hi, this is Ann Foster. Happy to be here. Thank you. And Councillor Belcott, and then Gabriella. Hello, Councillor Michelle Belcott. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you for being here. Hi, this is Gabriela Ewing. Thank you. And let's see. Do we have Terry Nolan? Toland, I mean. He's in the room. It's a little confusing with the double Zoom panelists. Maybe I'll just say, are there any other CAG members that I missed? Hi, good evening. This is Janet Konefsky. Thank Hi, you, this Janet. Is, Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> this is Monica Zazueta with my little Rufio. <laughs> Being a mom. Thanks so much for joining Being us, Monica. Mom. Anyone else?
All right. Well, I think over to Jenna for some updates. All right. Thank you. And thank you all for your patience in the room with our technical difficulties today. Um, so I'm going to run through um, essentially a miscellaneous list of updates that I have to share with you all. Um, so to start, thank you to those of you who submitted stipend forms to me. Um, if you have not done that and you are still interested in possibly receiving a stipend uh, for attending these meetings, uh, please fill out that form and send it to me by the end of the week. Um, next is a reminder to please complete your open government training if you have not done so already. Um, another reminder, and I'm going to periodically do this throughout the project, is to remind you all to not reply all to any email that we send you or any calendar invite that we send you um, just to keep us all in compliance with Open Public Meetings Act. And if you see someone do it by accident, don't reply to them either. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, we are planning to share public comments that we receive you know, between one meeting and the next as part of your meeting packet. So you may have seen we, we received one comment uh, shortly after the last meeting, so we put that in your meeting materials. So we'll continue to do that so you have a sense of what people are saying um, who maybe aren't at the table with you all in these meetings. Um, let's see. We also received a request from one of you on um, how to find a copy of the current comprehensive plan. Uh, so we are going to add a link um, to the meeting materials uh, from today on your web page so that for those of you who may be interested in getting a better sense of what that document is, um, it should be an easier way to find it than navigating the county website on your own. Um, okay, next is, um, we've also had some questions on who should I contact when I have a question about this project or this group. So I am your single point of contact, so please send me a note, call me, and then I will redirect it to whoever is the appropriate person to respond. Let's see. Okay. You also may be seeing news releases or email communication about other activities that are going on related to this project. So, um, for instance, you may see announcements about environmental justice coalition meetings or we'll do some broad public engagement activities as well. So, um, you are welcome to attend any of those other activities as a member of the public, but there isn't an expectation that you, that you do that as part of this group. Um, if you are unclear, if you see a communication around this project and you're not sure if it applies to you or not, please feel free to let me know. We are trying as best we can to, you know, say the words community advisory group and anything that's specific to this group. And, you know, when we email you, we will put those words in the email because we do know there's just other things going on related to this project that can be a little bit confusing. Um, but if you have questions, just please, please let me know. Um, and then finally, in terms of other updates, in terms of what else has been going on with the project, um, our other advisory group, the Environmental Justice Coalition, they had their second meeting last week as well. You'll be seeing a very similar presentation to what they saw um, later today. Um, and then they, otherwise, they're really working on um, getting their engagement plans together. So we'll have some more updates from them probably starting in May once the first of their engagement work begins. Okay, those are my updates. All right. I will just keep working through those technology issues. Um, okay, well, um, we'll just keep going. And actually, I did, there are a couple more notes. Folks in the room, if you need to find restrooms, they're just out this door to the left. And there's some food behind me here. So if you haven't eaten yet, feel free to stand up at any time you want and just help yourself to, to something to eat. Okay, so next we're going to go into a few of the group agreements for how we operate together. And we started going through some of this at our last meeting, um, but today just want to highlight a few. These were all included in the um, equity-based process and engagement plan, which you also have in your meeting packets and, and have been emailed those a couple of times. So we hope that you're, you know, printing those out and looking at them and, and making them kind of be a part of how we operate as a group. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just going to highlight a few of those. 
and then we can see if folks have any questions or any concerns about these agreements. So again, just a reminder, the role of the community advisory group, and we might say this over, you know, for several times throughout the process, is really you are a consensus-based recommendation body, and um, we, you know, we, we know you all have a range of perspectives and experiences, and your charge is really to help develop the goal and policy recommendations for the climate element, so for the resilience and greenhouse gas reduction pieces of the climate element. Uh, we do expect that you would consider public feedback at key points as well, and um, that you would apply the equity lens that's being developed by the Environmental Justice Coalition, and you'll learn much more about the equity lens as we move forward. So that's briefly your role. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is a little hard to see on the screen, but it's this was printed, or I'm sorry, this was sent in a um, meeting material to you previously. And this is just reminding folks that for, for the council, there was a memo that went out that showed kind of who the CAG members are and what your representation is. And the idea that the, the county worked really hard to find a group of people that are representative of lots and lots of different interests. So you, it is expected that you would sort of represent the interests that you're listed as. And some of you represent, you know, specific uh, businesses or industries, right? So we hope you're bringing all that information to bear. We also know that you're just people and that you're going to bring your own perspectives here too. So of course that's welcome, but it's helpful to just kind of look at that memo to get a better understanding of, you know, what kind of representation you're coming in as. Next slide. Uh, we do have a council liaison, Councillor Belcott, who of course introduced herself uh, when we went around the table. So Councillor, thanks for being here. And we just want to clarify the role of the council liaison. So the council liaison is a non-voting member of the committee, but has a really important purpose to attend these meetings, listen to the discussion, um, and raise any concerns that she might hear, right? She might be thinking, well, the council would say this, or the council will be thinking this. So kind of bringing in that feedback loop so that you all have a sense of what would be acceptable to the council and so that your recommendations are in line with, with what is important to the council as well. Um, and so she might be bringing in that feedback at key points as well. So counselor, thank you again for being here and playing that really important role. Let's go to the next slide. I think there's just two more here or three more here. So this is the uh, general group agreements and these are really the um, CAG members are expected to really, you, you have a lot on your plate with this process and we do expect that you would come to these meetings whenever you can and if you're not able to come, then uh, stay briefed on what's happening, right? Watch the meeting recordings, read the materials in advance, come prepared. Uh, we expect you to work towards consensus-based approach, collaborative solutions. You all have different perspectives and really important perspectives to bring to the process. So bringing those fully, but also listening and trying to do a little bit of the give and take as we get to the difficult recommendation, what can sometimes be a difficult recommendations process. Uh, and of course, we want you to communicate your ideas and suggestions early to avoid surprises, right? We don't want to go down the road and realize, oh, this, there was this great idea, but we didn't talk about it early, and so now it just feels a little bit, of, a little bit late to incorporate it. So bring your suggestions and concerns in early on. Um, next slide. These, these slides are just a little bit on what consensus means and how we plan to get there in this process. So when we talk about consensus, it really means that you can live with the outcome, right? So that the goals and policies that we develop generally align with your needs and interests. There might be some details that you don't love. There might be some words that you would prefer to wordsmith, but in general, you can live with it and, and it's you know pretty much as good as it can get with a group that has such broad perspectives. Uh, and on the next slide, we have the way that we plan to try to get this group to consensus throughout the process. So as we have our meetings and get into more of the substantive discussions, we'll use informal check-ins, kind of straw polls to see where people are at. You know, like, are we getting close? Are we 90% there? Are we 30% there and we need way more work? So just kind of getting a sense of that and maybe even having some tentative agreements, right? Like maybe it's, we can all agree to this, but it's contingent on this next piece that might inform the first piece. So we'll, we'll um, use those processes as we go forward. And then at key points, we'll ask for, you know, around the table formal level of support um, where we hope that we can get consensus. 
Um, and then in terms of the consensus recommendation or, or whatever we get to at the end, whether it's a consensus recommendation or whether it's just a document that shows diverse interest, if we're not able to come to consensus, that will all be forwarded to the Planning Commission and the County Council at the end of the process. Um, so we hope it's a consensus recommendation, but if not, then you know something that documents all the different ideas and then uh, the Council can kind of see where the committee's at. Next slide. I think that was all of it on the process pieces. So those are, you know, what we see as some of the key group agreements. And I would just open it up to see if folks have any questions, comments, concerns about that. And feel free if you're in the Zoom platform to just raise your hand. If you're here, you know, you can do this to raise your tent. But we also don't have that many people, so you can just speak up. <laughs> Yeah, Brent. I'll just mention that I, I think those are excellent guidelines. And actually, I'm a member of other organizations, and I'm taking these as an inspiration for guidelines for other organizations. Good to hear that. Thanks, Brent. Anyone have concerns and can't live with these guidelines? OK, great. I don't see any hands in the Zoom, so I, will, I think we'll just keep moving because we have a lot we want to get through. Um, thank you, everyone. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Jenna now for an overview of the work plan. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit about that engagement and process plan, and if you looked at it, in the back of it, it has... Um, an approximate schedule of uh, how we'll spend each advisor group meeting. Um, but I want to take a step back and look really big picture at our project work plan. So this slide that's showing right now, along the top it has a you know, general project timeline from now moving forward. And um, as you might recall from our first meeting, there are two key pieces to this new required climate element um, that we need to do as part of this legislation. One is we need a resiliency sub-element, and then two is we need a greenhouse gas reduction sub-element. Um, so I'm going to walk through sort of the sort of big chunks of the process for each of those sub-elements. Um, so this spring, we are going to be following a series of steps uh, to really assess the project projected climate impacts in the county. And we'll be looking for your review and feedback on that work over the next few months to help us with the background pieces to the resilience work. And then by late spring and into the summer, we'll uh, shift to asking for your help to help identify priority areas to focus on for policy development to improve resiliency. We'll ask for your help identifying cr criteria to evaluate those policy ideas. And that will lead us to developing, we'll eventually get to developing a goal and policy list with your guidance. Um, focused on the resilience piece. So that'll mostly wrap up this summer. Um, at that point, county staff behind the scenes, we're going to take what you all came up with, uh, some of the background information that the consultants provide, and we're going to format it into a draft sub-element. So you all will be focused on the substance, sorry, too loud. <laughs> um, well, on the substance, and then we'll do some, you know, for, formatting of it to, um, get it ready for the adoption process when it will go um, make its way before the Planning Commission and County Council as part of the updated comprehensive plan. Okay, so that's that resilience sub-element in the, the middle there. Um, now at the bottom, if we look at the greenhouse gas reduction sub-element, this spring the consultant team is working behind the scenes on a greenhouse gas inventory. And so this is a data collection exercise. Um, and they're also doing a little bit of other background research for us. Um, and that information will be ready by the summer. So that's the point where we will share the results of the um, inventory with you all. Um, and then we'll be looking to you to get some guidance on priority um, areas to focus, um, setting some uh, targets and interim targets, and criteria to um, evaluate policy ideas. Um, in the fall, uh, by then we'll be getting to developing this goal and policy list. So that's when 
you all will be helping give us guidance on, on what makes sense uh, for greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and our hope is then by the end of the year or into very early 2025, we'll wrap that up. And then similarly, staff and staff will take what you all decide, we'll make it into look like it's part of a chapter, <laughs> um, and we'll basically have a, climate, a draft climate chapter, which will get put into the rest of the updated comprehensive plan and go through the adoption process in 2025. Um, so the, one other thing I just wanted to point out on this slide is there's some boxes that sort of have a pastel color on them. Those are supposed to highlight where this group is really, that's really where you all are really involved in the process. Um, so just wanted to highlight that. So hopefully that's a helpful sort of big picture of what's going on over the next uh, year plus, um, but glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, any questions from around the room or if you're on the Zoom platform, go ahead and raise your hand. Right, I think everyone's just ready to dive into the work. Um, great. Well, I think, Jenna, we're back to you again on the vision statement. And so I'll just remind everyone that at the, after the last meeting, we sent out a survey to get your thoughts on three questions to help with developing a vision statement. So Jenna is going to, you know, talk a little bit about how a vision statement's used, what you all said, and then reveal a draft vision statement. And then we'll have some time to hear your input, see what you would want to change there, and then we would come back to the next meeting with a revised vision statement. So back to you, Jenna. Hey, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Sylvia was saying. Um, we sent out that survey after the last meeting. Thank you to those of you who provided feedback through it. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we like to do visioning when we can with groups like this is because it's nice to, before we get into the details, sort of come up with a shared vision of a future that we might all like to see. And then as we get into the details later on, it's something we can pull out and look at again and say, you know, how are we doing um, compared to this vision? You know, are we helping ourselves get there or no? So it really is a, you know, one way, it's a guidepost we can look back at again down the road. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right, so I'm just gonna walk through the three questions that were in that survey and share back at a high level uh, what you all provided. Um, and then we'll get to a very rough first draft vision statement. Um, so the first prompt was about your experience and how does climate impact your day-to-day -day lived experience for yourself or your community? And um, we, th we saw, you know, sort of two types of responses. There were um, those around the physical environment, such as warming temperatures, more heat or summer heat, changes in precipitation, increase in episodic events, worse air quality, fires and smoke, flooding, less water for power, irrigation, salmon, agriculture, and drinking water, less snowmelt and more insects. And then people mentioned impacts to livelihood, such as utility and insurance costs, states daily life, influences choices, daily comfort, I live, lives in a forest and works outside daily, so affects me every time I go outside, unpredictability and anxiety, uncertainty about the future, taxes, local resources, health, mental health, and hard to play outside with kids. Um, let's go to the next slide. So the second prompt was about your values. Uh, when you think about your local community, economy, and environment, what do you hold most sacred? What is most important to protect and why? So some of the things we heard were about safety for all, transportation to access all of the county, quality of life and livability, business interruption from extreme weather events, agriculture, open spaces, green spaces, nature and the natural environment, water, the economy, healthy food access and education, health of family, community, planet, mentally, physically, and emotionally. And some of the responses got at that why piece, uh, such as these resources are not recoverable, we need to think about future generations and both human and animal species. 
We need to allow for community influence and ensure balance among values and impacts. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the third prompt was about your community. And we asked, what does a healthy community look like? What is important to creating it? And uh, what you all said was, yeah, you mentioned resilient and sustainable, less cars, more alternative transit, less concrete and infrastructure, more natural areas, infrastructure that promotes a sense of community, more athletic and recreation infrastructure, no pollution or emissions, Residents feel safe, connected, and have a say in how they live. Respect ourselves, each other, and the environment. Courtesy, cooperation, communication. Connected and inclusive. Everyone's basic needs are met. Less asthma, cancer, birth defects, and smog. Community with shared well-being goals. Honest conversations about injustices in our communities. Ecological balance, we don't exceed the limits of Earth's living systems, and finances in service of life, not in service to life, not wealth. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, so this, like I said, this is a first draft, um, and we're gonna look, we're looking for your feedback on it. But our, our hope was to try to take the responses that you provided in the survey and try to craft it into a statement. Uh, Oh, yes, for those in the room, we did print it. Okay, so I'm just going to read it. 20 years from now, we envision Clark County as a community where we all feel safe, included, and respected. We meet our entire community's basic needs and all have access to healthy air to breathe, safe water to drink, healthy food options, affordable homes that keep us warm in the winter and cool in the summer. We are collectively driving less and we are polluting less at home, work, school, and play, and when traveling in between. We are better prepared to cope with weather, weather emergencies and uncertainties. We are good stewards of the land and are living within the limits of our environment. Our quality of life is better, and our entire community has easy access to parks and nature, recreation and health facilities, locally grown food, a wide range of convenient, sustainable transportation options, and community places to convene, connect, and celebrate. We are healthier physically, mentally, and emotionally. Our community's businesses and jobs are innovative, adaptable, and sustainable. And we are leaving Clark County a better place for future generations to grow up and grow old. Okay, I'm going to pass it back to you, Sylvia. Hey, thank you, Jenna, and thanks for all your work in you know, taking what was said and, and turning it into a statement. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, so now we'd like to see from the committee your thoughts on this. You know, is this sounding like a vision that you would want for this climate change portion of the comprehensive plan? Um, does it represent where, what you would want to see for a vision statement? So I'll just open up the floor. You know, folks have um, comments, additions, Anything you want to add? And I see some some hands in the Zoom, so I'll start there and then I'll um, head back. And and maybe just do the like ten card thing so that I just do that, then I won't forget about you if I if you're waiting for too long. But um, I'll go first to Don and then to to Monica. Uh, thank you. I would like to see in the draft vision statement something to the effect that we are on target to meeting the state goals of reducing emissions. Like the state goals are something like. Uh, reduce emissions 95% by 2050, and we should be doing that gradually and be on track to meeting that goal. So that maybe might be something like reduce emissions 85% by 2044, which is 20 years from now. And uh, uh, thank you, that's all. Thank you, thank you, Don, that's helpful. And Monica? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to thank everyone for putting our uh, uh, what we submitted into that beautiful work. Um, I loved hearing um, that, yes, we need to provide for everyone in the community um, where they're at and also within the means of our planetary boundaries. Like we cannot forget that we are nature. 
Um, maybe even having that language in there that we are nature. So anything that we do to our mother earth, we do to ourselves um, and to not forget that. But yeah, um, I thank you. I like, I was like snapping. I was like, yeah, I, like, I even shouted. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. And thank you for your enthusiasm. It's very infectious. Really appreciate it. Um, let's go to Dave Rowe. Yeah, I'm Dave Rowe and I'm interested in transportation. That's my, my life. Um, but Clark County has tremendous uh, opportunities for transit development because we have rail infrastructure that's been built since 1908. And so as we per proceed, I'd like to talk about transportation. Thanks, Dave. So maybe add something in here about transportation as well. Um, Karen Ferguson. Karen, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. I think you might. Oops. Sorry about that. I thought I put it on. Um, we are prepared to deal with a changing climate and are instituting mitigation practices. Thank you, Sharon. And Nelson? Thank you. Uh, I would like to see um, something reflecting um, a resilient energy system. Adding something about a resilient energy system. Yeah, Brent. I will just mention that this is a pretty big vision statement with uh, there's nine separate items on it already. And I think probably for a really effective vision statement, we should think about simplifying it just, just to make it more clear and so that we can, we can have a better vision of the vision. Noted. Sometimes you just keep adding and adding and adding, and it might dilute. So, and consider how to consolidate that. Um, Gabriella. Yes, thank you. Um, maybe uh, educating the community should be in that statement. I thought I saw it, but I'm looking for it and I don't find it. So, thank you. And Monica, did you have another comment or is your hand still up? Okay, go ahead. I did. I, I was uh, just going to echo, uh, or I was uh, going to say the same thing as Gabriella. Like, we need to educate our community. Um, uh, we're in this, but other people are, you know, doing other things and everything. And so we need to have visual aids of like, you know, where th they can come and go or what they can see. Uh, of like how to recycle or how to do things and uh, where they can volunteer, how they can get a hold of their electeds or how they just even like uh, I always have the idea of billboards because we have billboards out there that literally are um, advertising lottery winnings and healthcare and I'm like ah <laughs> where's climate action um, and so um, and also um, with I saw in there too it was um, collectively driving less um, providing other options like just like what, what about collectively driving less yeah that's great but it's like what about like bikes and rollerblades and whatever else, you know, like actually putting in um, like uh, uh, ideas of, of, of how we do that. But yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. And Noel? I think it's somewhat implied, but um, the statement where uh, we are good stewards of land and, and living within the limit, limits of the environment um, good stewards of the land and natural resources, potentially. Good. Thanks, Noel. 
right, anyone else? Well, I think we've taken some good notes on these additional ideas and we'll can put that together, maybe try to simplify, although you heard this was a lot, so it's a big task, um, and come back to the next meeting with uh, an updated vision statement for you all. Um, any other general comments or questions about the vision? Um, Andrea? Yeah, I was just curious. I don't think this fits in, but it's something that I think about a lot when um, we're trying to shift the the conversation towards driving less and whatnot is like how is there a like emergency plan in place aside from weather emergencies um like if i don't know there was a massive earthquake or something um and how we would help help people in those situations so i don't know if like that's something that needs to come out of a different group or different department but i think that's something that should be addressed as well Yeah, that's Jenna, do you have any thoughts on that question? Yeah, there, so the county does have a natural hazard mitigation plan, which um, actually later today we're going to hear from our resilience technical team a bit more, um, which will, they've been looking at it as they've been beginning their work. Um, so there is an existing plan. Um, we don't I don't think we'll get into the details of what is and isn't covered necessarily in it today, but um, it's something we can um, we can definitely try to summarize, you know, what does exist uh, versus what, where there may be some gaps and we might need to um, fill those in as part of this project. And Janet? Um, I, just a question for clarification. Is this um, typical or best practice across um, the country when working with groups like this to have this lengthy of a vision statement instead of a vision plus goals? Is this typical? With my experience is, I think vision statements vary from very brief to longer. So I think it's a, there's a lot of styles, I think on how, how these could be written. Um, I think the, you know, the main idea is to keep it pretty high level, right? And um, we'll, we'll get to the details as we do the work, you know, but, um, but it could be, it could definitely be shorter and simplified, or it could be, sometimes you see vision statements, you know, that are over a page long. So, um, I don't know, Sylvia or, or others, if I want to chime in on what you've seen. Hi, so this is Gary Albrecht. So, you know, uh, Clark County has got a, 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 a community advisory, a bicycle community advisory committee. So they, they have a vision statement in that, and, and it's based on an existing plan. We have a Clark County Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan. So that the vision statement supports uh, implementing the bike pedestrian plan. But so it, it, it is normal practice to have a vision statement. That's what I want to say as the bottom line is, is so this will help us in the end because we don't we don't have the end piece like the, the, the Bike Pedestrian Advisory Committee has the plan already in place. This one we're developing the policies. So it'll be good for us to have that vision of, of, you know, bouncing back and seeing, is this where we want to go with the vision with these policies? Thanks, Gary. And I think maybe Janet, you're probably through your question saying that maybe this one is a little too long. I, if it's serving the purpose, I mean, when we work with corporations and organizations to build their, their vision, this would, this, this is not typical. Um, but if it's serving a purpose to lead us down the line of making sure what we develop is aligned with our vision, then yes. Um, I just, the length of it, I didn't know if it was going to serve the purpose or if this was typical across countries or municipalities to have a pretty lengthy, what looks like goals to me um, in, a, in a vision statement. I could go either way. I just didn't know if it was serving the purpose for communication, for the public, for internally guiding us, or all of the above. Okay, that's helpful clarification. Well, I would definitely support condensing it a bit. 
I do think there is some redundancy and statements that were were redundant if we can keep them broader rather than narrow. I think it makes sense. Uh, we have a tall task ahead of us. We don't need to make it taller with a expanded vision statement. <laughs> I, I too am supportive of advancing it. Hearing a lot of support for that. Yeah, Brent. As I mentioned, uh, I'm working with another group and we're doing bylaws and then policies and plans and projects. So I can see here the vision statement as something um, short, precise, and inspirational. And then coming from that, as, as Gary mentioned, then you have your more detailed plans. So as, as some of the people are saying, a relatively short and precise but powerful vision statement. And then coming from that are, are the other, the, the more detailed things. And the, we know the goal of the policies will likely be relatively long, so the vision statement may be shorter, would be helpful. Um, I'll go to Monica and then Sharon. Hi. Um, so I am um, going for the, I like the the everything in there because it's what we choose to put in and, and see is what, what either gets left out or gets put in. <laughs> My baby's crawling all over me. Um, and so, um, I mean, it, and then we can go back to it. It's like, hey, is this what is in line with our vision and everything? You know, because like, um, what what we put on paper is is what is going to to be like, all right, is this here or is it not here? So I I like the length. I like having all of our thoughts in there. It was every it was all of us, all of our thoughts collectively together. And so I don't want to leave anything out. So that means like someone's thoughts are left out as well. Um, and so those are my thoughts on the the length of it. Um, and who we tell ourselves that we are is is who we become. And so I want to make sure that we have a strong foundation um, going forward. Thank you. Yes, I just want to say about the vision statement that I'd like it in the form of bullet points rather than a narrative paragraph um, type, type statement, only because it's easy to grasp, you know, um, and it, it lists really what, what the statement is in bullet points, and um, it's just easy to see and, and understand what, what the statement is. And Janet? Yeah, um, really quick. And I I um I wanna caution though, as we when we draft legal documents or whatnot, when you get so specific and use it as your North Star, we could inadvertently be leaving out topics later on that we try and fit into the plan if we don't generalize um and, and give ourselves some flexibility. So it's just one drawback in getting very specific. Um, so that later on down the road, when we're um, looking at something or unintended, um, you know, left out, um, something that we're not thinking about today, but as we dive into it might make a big impact later. I just, I just want to caution. I like the fact that we're putting this input, but getting so specific could also give us some guardrails that are unintended. Oh, that's helpful. Thanks. And Justin? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, um, just vocalize my support for an abbreviated vision statement. I think a vision statement is saying to the community what our work is going to accomplish, and then the goals and policies can be separate of how we're going to get there. Um, so just wanted to say maybe a three to four sentence paragraph kind of outlining our vision, what we're going to do, and you know, just wanted to give that input. Yes, uh, this is Terry. I agree with that uh, statement. Um, a vision statement that is uh, clear and brief that you can memorize even and have uh, an elevator speech. Uh, and then a separate goals uh, that happen. Great. Um, and Don? Uh, this does not look to me like a vision statement for climate for a climate element of the 
Growth Management Act. It looks maybe more appropriate for the entire growth management comprehensive plan, mm -hmm. but the uh, our group is meeting on climate and it barely mentions that, barely hints at it in this. And so I would like to have more focus on climate and emissions reduction. Thank you. And Janet, do you have another comment? Okay, hand up from the floor. Okay, well, I think that that was all really good input and I'm hearing a lot of support for a shorter statement and Monica, hearing you that we don't wanna miss anything but it seems like maybe the goals and policies and the later products are where those details would live. Um, and I think we've gotten a lot of good thoughts on other things that could be added in. And so we'll work together to try to craft something for the next meeting. Okay, great. Well, um, we have time for a bit of a break. And then when we come back, we're gonna talk about climate hazards and impacts. So we're gonna have Dana and Zachary join us virtually to lead a presentation and we'll have lots of time for discussion. So I'll give folks in the room time for a break and maybe we'll do a little bit longer so folks can get some food. Um, it's 626, so let's get back together at 640. We're still a little ahead of schedule, so I think a 14 minute break could serve as well. Um, so folks on the line, just come back at 640. We'll see you then.
then talk about what's being called hazards. Resilience element of the have a conversation on hazards and we're going to Sylvia, if you're trying to speak, you are on mute. Uh, can you hear me now, Maria? Yes, thank you. Well, I will start over. <laughs> thank you, Maria, for letting me know that get into a conversation on climate hazards and impacts. And um, Sylvia, you are just give a little coming in and out again. It's like we're hearing every two, three words. coming through not really well instead of talking more i'm just going to hand it over to uh dana and zachary since they're up anyway go ahead dana and zachary and we'll figure it out over here thanks sylvia i uh, hope everyone can hear me okay let me know if not um Hi, everybody. My name is Dana Hellman. I'm with Kappa Strategies, and I'm joined by my colleague, Zachary Boyce. Uh, we are working on the climate resiliency sub-element of this work. So let me pull up my PowerPoint. One moment, please. OK. Get in presentation mode. OK, hopefully everyone can see this OK on small screens. We're going to show some maps, so you might be able to zoom in as needed. Um, this is a little bit of a zoomed in version of what Jenna showed earlier that pertains specifically to the climate resiliency sub element that we'll be talking about today. So just for those who aren't really familiar with this language, climate resilience or resiliency, um, it's defined in the Department of Commerce guidance as the ongoing process of anticipating, preparing for, and adapting to changes in climate and minimizing negative impacts to our natural systems, infrastructure, and communities. So uh, a simpler way to think about it, which is a definition I prefer to use, is just we're really looking, when we're talking about climate resilience for this work, we're looking for opportunities to make communities and assets more prepared for climate-related stress and more able to bounce back from climate-related stress. Um, so that's our focus. The first component of this work, which will be taking place starting today and going through April, is the process of exploring climate impacts. So today we're going to introduce you to some hazards, assets, and impacts. In April, we'll do some pairing of hazards and assets. So for example, we'll look at what might happen when the hazard of flooding meets the asset of farmland. Um, and then also in April, we're going to ask for some input from you all and the other stakeholder groups about impacts. So we'll be trying to create some impact narratives, getting a better sense of how climate change is experienced in unincorporated Clark County, and also eventually asking you to help us make the final selection of which hazards are going to make it into the, the next phases of this work. Um, in May, we will start talking about risk and vulnerability. And again, we'll ask for some feedback to make sure that we're characterizing risk and vulnerability in a way that makes sense. And then in May and June, as Jenna mentioned, we'll get into that really meaty content of identifying resilience goals and policies that address the specific priorities that we'll be talking about over the next few meetings. So here in this table, you can see in the left-hand column under climate hazards, this is a list of hazards that we're currently considering including in our um, resiliency sub-element. And then in that middle column there, you can see how 
the climate hazards we're talking about today align with hazards that have been specifically identified in the Clark County Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. So it's not a perfect one-to-one -one match, although some of them do match quite nicely with what's in the hazard plan. Uh, and then in that third column, you can see how those hazards have been ranked in priority for unincorporated Clark County according to the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. So couple that stand out, um, severe weather is one, and that includes the two climate hazards, extreme heat and storms. That's so severe weather has been ranked as a high priority for Clark County, and flooding has also been ranked pretty high, medium to high. Um, one thing you might notice that definitely uh, is often, you know, brought up in conversations about climate change, but doesn't appear on this list is sea level rise. And we've decided to leave that off as a primary climate hazard because there's no evidence that sea level rise is going to directly affect Clark County in the sense that we're not likely to see um, seawater inundation in Clark County. But we will talk about sea level rise a little bit when we get to um, a section on tidal flooding later on. So that's coming up. One thing we'll just flag now, um, which may be intuitive to many of you, is just that um, these climate hazards that we're talking about, in a few minutes we'll get into some projections for each of these hazards and what impacts they might cause, but something important to remember is that most of these don't exist in isolation. There can be a lot of interaction between climate hazards. They can often occur at the same time or one can lead to another. So some examples, uh, extreme heat and drought, when those two things occur at the same time, that can create really dry conditions, which create the right environment for wildfire to burn. Um, another common one is if we have storms with heavy precipitation, that can lead to flooding, it can also lead to landslides. And yet another one, if you follow that thread through the middle of the diagram there, is um, if a wildfire burns and kind of burns up all the vegetation and the trees on a hillside. If it later rains and there's flooding on that hillside, without the tree roots and the vegetation to kind of slow and hold that water, there's a higher chance for landslides potentially. So those are just a few examples and we just wanna flag that and keep in mind that many of these hazards are interacting with each other. And then beyond that, just something that I think is gonna come up, it's certainly reflected in um, some of the the goals and vision statement points that we saw earlier is just this reminder that social factors are also at play when we're thinking about um, climate impacts. So we know that some populations or some neighborhoods or geographic areas might be more exposed to certain climate hazards because often because of past planning decisions. So for example, uh, resident low-income residential development in floodplains um, another really common example that we like to point to is the historical practice of um, housing discrimination through redlining. So that practice had non-white home buyers largely concentrated in specific neighborhoods that were considered to be in decline. And now if you look at those formerly redlined neighborhoods today, they tend to be hotter, um, have worse air pollution, and have less um, green infrastructure, fewer trees, fewer green spaces. Uh, another factor is sensitivity. So cer certain hazards might hit everyone at the same time. Wildfire smoke is a really good example of that. Everyone in, a, in the county might be hit by wildfire smoke simultaneously, but certain people will be more sensitive to that due to things like pre-existing health conditions or age. So if someone has asthma, they'll be more sensitive to wildfire smoke than someone who does not. And then the third thing to keep in mind here is adaptive capacity. So another way to think of that is just what is a person's ability to either avoid harm from a climate hazard or to recover from a climate hazard? And some things that can help increase capacity are things like disposable income, strong social support networks, and access to health insurance or homeowners insurance. Another important piece of this equation, so we've been talking about hazards, we're going to talk soon about impacts, but another important piece here is assets. Um, so these are the resources and facilities, 
um, the services that you value, that your community values that could be negatively impacted by climate change. And so things that we wanna think about potentially protecting. Uh, we're going to revisit this list later on in the meeting tonight. So I'm not gonna spend too long on here. I know there's a lot of text here. You don't feel like you have to absorb it all. You'll get a printout of this later, but just wanted to point to it so you know it's here. And I'll also mention, this is page two of this table. Um, these community assets are organized according to 11 sectors, and those sectors were uh, provided to us by the Department of Commerce guidance. And so in a few minutes, when we start talking about climate impacts, you'll see the impacts also organized according to those sectors. So it's just a helpful talking point. Okay, so whoop, before I turn it over to Zachary, who's gonna give us some hazard projection maps and impacts information, um, I would just like to say, we're about to share a lot of data, a lot of climate data, just to help us all get on the same page. And so you all can see what we're seeing. Um, however, the the reason we're talking about this and the, the main purpose of our uh, conversation today is really to get a sense of how you all have experienced these hazards, what impacts are on your minds, what concerns you have. So, and you will have these slides later on. So if the maps go by too quickly, uh, you'll have another chance to see them again in the future. And um, just to prep you for what's coming, we're gonna organize the next section here where we'll present to you a couple of um, different climate hazards, and then we'll take a discussion break. So it'll be two or three hazards, discussion and reflection, two or three hazards, discussion and reflection, so that we'll, we can break those up a little bit and we will have some time for general questions at the end as well. So with that, let me turn it on over to Zachary. Hello, hi everyone. Uh Nice to see you all. Thank you so much for being here so late. I know it's uh, stretching on to the evening, even though we have a little, a couple few hours of uh, daylight left, thanks to daylight savings time. Uh, we're gonna talk now about the, the hazard analysis section. And then the first thing that I have up to talk to you about is how we, how we got the data uh, in the first place. So we were asked to use this uh, web dashboard that was uh, produced by the University of Washington. Um, you can see a picture of it there to the right, um, wherein you can select the county um, sector hazard and then scenario. Uh, and so we took that and did, did a little pre-analysis to sort of associate certain hazards with certain um, climate climate hazards, uh, right? And the data in the dashboard, the form that it appears in is raster data and can be a, a little bit of an intimidating word if you're not familiar with GIS, but essentially what it is are these rectangles that contain one data value per rectangle. They're approximately, they, they vary in, in resolution, but they're approximately five by seven miles. And so they're about at the scale of a city. Um, so what we do is we aggregate that data to the unincorporated uh, <clears throat> the unincorporated Clark County level um, in order to inform what what our projections are for for various climate hazards. And then the scenario that we're using, where we have multiple available, is the RCP 8.5, uh, which sounds very jargony, but it's just the business as usual. So if we don't make any change in the emissions that we've uh, been emitting you know, for the past 30 years, for the past, I guess, more than 30 years, let's say like since 1950 or so, um, then that's what we would expect to see as a change uh, in, the, in the climate. And then finally, the time frame that's being represented is this uh, near term time frame of 2020. So looking a little bit in the past uh, to 2050, 2049. So we're comparing that to then the previous 30 years, which we'll discuss in the next slide. All right, and bear with me while th while this gets a little bit technical, but um, I spoke to you about the rectangles, which we can call raster cells or just cells. Um, where there is overlap between these cells and the area of interest that we're looking at, um, we have to be careful not to give too much influence to the cells that overlap the area of interest less than the other cells do, right? So we need to give a pro proportional weight 
to the cells that take up most of the space. And as you can see in this polygon to the right, um, this value, negative 4.9, is taking up most of the space. So it deserves most of the most of the value, right? So if we took a regular, a regular, <laughs> I did it backwards, um, a regular mean, we would get negative 5.8, and that would consider all these values that are overlapping the outline that we're seeing. But instead, we get a slightly lower value because this negative 4.9 gets a higher percent of influence in the total that we find. Finally, we took a quadrant approach. So the number that you'll pay attention to mostly is the area-wide unincorporated uh, number that we found, but uh, we we think it's useful to look at this spatial variation between hazards. And so if you are located in, you know, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, um, you, you can get an idea of how risk is concentrated in that specific area. All right. And now <clears throat> we're about to begin the map section. So I want to give you a little bit of an anatomy of how these maps work and what to pay attention to. At the very top line, we have our hazard of concern. In this case, it would be drought. Um, it, it will cycle through different uh, hazards. We'll look at about uh, uh, six six of those. Uh, the climate metric is next down, and this describes which metric we're looking at in association which, with that hazard of concern. So you'll have the, the title, late summer precipitation in this case, and then a description of what that metric represents, which I will reiterate when the slides pass through. Below that, we have change indica indicator arrows. Um, as I mentioned, we have this quadrant approach, which walks you through the four um, quadrants. And then at the very end, uh, that this is where we, we want your eyes to go in terms of like getting a sense of all of the unincorporated uh, area in Clark County, how, how that would be best represented. The map is right below that. Uh, and then to the right, there's a legend to help you make sense of the hazard and its distribution uh, in the area. Next slide, please. All right, so the first slide we're gonna look at is drought and the first, just like I mentioned on the last slide, is uh, late summer precipitation. And so that is represented as percent change in total precipitation for July 15th through September 15th. So a typically low low precipitation um, uh, uh, time in, in regionally. Um, so area-wide, we're seeing a negative uh, 7%, so a decrease of 7% uh, across the area. And then if you look at the map, which we won't leave up for very long, we can see a concentration of that risk in the top right or the northeast corner of Clark County. Next slide. We'll look at one more metric for drought, which is precipitation drought. And this is the likelihood. If you're familiar with probability, then it'll be natural to you, but otherwise, this is just saying for every year, what chance is there that we would have less than 75% of precipitation than, than we normally had in the previous 30 years, right? It can be quite intimidating, but in these blue circles, you'll see the percent chance of that happening. So for every year, we have a 31% chance uh, on average that we would see one of those years below 75% of the historical normal. All right, and then now on to the uh, anticipated impacts of drought. Uh, I would love to, yes. Is there a question? This is Dave Rowe. That last mm -hmm. slide you showed, the highest risk of drought was around Mount St. Helens. That doesn't look right to me. That's the only comment I had. Yeah, we. I mean, we we can certainly address like more granular questions. Um, I I would have to investigate the map further, but these are these are coarse and like downscaled climate projections. But uh, the relative accuracy of a five by seven uh, mile raster cell, um, certainly we can get into the weeds on that. But uh, for now, I think it might be best to just keep moving through the presentation to the hazard impacts. All right. Um, so the drought impacts, um, we've broken this up sectorally, and the first one, looking at agriculture, um, obviously a, a concern across agriculture and the economy where we're seeing long-term reduced water supply. This has uh, drastic implications like across the, the, entire, um, uh, the, the entire sector 
list that, that we devised. Um, obviously, for ecosystems, less water um, means hotter water. Uh, it means uh, worse salmonid habitat, which has cultural implications as well. And then the very obvious one, water resources, um, are a decrease in our ability to or capacity to generate energy uh, at, at hydroelectric dams like in the region, which are a huge source of power. Um, and yeah, that's that's about it for that slide. Next slide, please. All right. The next hazard of concern we're looking at is extreme heat. Um, and the first thing we want to look at is the change in number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it, the reason it says max humidex uh, above there, it, it's a lot like if you've heard of heat index before, it's a combination of uh, heat and humidity, so water vapor in the air, uh, but it's a little more stringent um, of a, or, or to use a less technical word, a, a little more severe, I guess, of a standard, right? So looking below, we're seeing an increase um, in the next 30 years, we should say, of 20 days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's that's what we anticipate. And then looking down in the map, you can see that where there's a concentration, even though they're not included in this analysis, but where there's a concentration of um, urban development, there is a concentration of heat. So uh, as you will all be familiar with the you know, population dynamics of the county, or we're seeing a lot of people, um, we're seeing a lot more heat because of uh, different surfaces that generate heat, like uh, impervious surface, like paved roads, um, parking lots, and, and the like. Next slide, please. All right. And then we'll, we'll up it a little bit to say um, that to, to look at days above not 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So just increasing the, the temperature by 10 degrees there. And then area-wide, you can see we're, we're seeing not an, an, not a significant uh, estimation of an increase, but that doesn't mean, uh, for example, that there would not be a, an anomalous heat event like the heat dome of 2021, which um, I'm sure we all felt temperatures up to 125 degrees. Um, so uh, the takeaway from this slide is not to say there's no risk of it. It's just the probabilistic like estimate of the days that would occur above 100 is is lower. Um, but it doesn't change the the climate system overall. And it is important to note that you know felt temperature at even at a threshold of 80 degrees, 85 degrees could be a very uh, significant um, Sig make a very significant dif difference in terms of human health and, and things that we're concerned about. Next slide. To that end, <laughs> we can look at the impacts of uh, extreme heat. And you know, for agriculture, right, when we see these uh, early heat waves, we've seen March, April heat waves, um, we see crop death and a huge strain on, on crops uh, in the region, especially in the unincorporated area. Um, the increased demand for water in, in times when water is not typically available. Um, so the hottest months are also the driest months uh, in, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, buildings and energy, obviously an uptick in AC usage. Um, we've actually actually seen from a utility level, like uh, our region switching from a, a winter winter dominant uh, energy usage to summer dominant uh, energy usage. Um, and then, cultural resources and practices, uh, same deal as we were talking about with drought, where water can heat up and even a couple of degrees makes a huge difference to um, salmon, um, right? Economic development, outdoor workers are affected. So we're talking about farm workers. Um, emergency management, uh, we'll, we'll see implications for having to respond to uh, illnesses that are, that are heat-related illnesses. Um, which segues into that health and well-being piece, and then water resources, um, kind of the same same level of impacts that we'd expect from uh, the agricultural and food systems. All right, we've made it to our first little discussion or reflection. Did you want to take it there, Dana? Yeah, actually, Sylvia is going to facilitate for us on this one if um, audio is working okay, Sylvia. I can't hear you, Sylvia, if you are speaking. Oh, you are speaking. I can see you, but I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. 
Is this mic working any better? Can you hear me okay now, Dana? So far, yeah. Yeah, let's give it a try. Oh, <laughs> great. Try. Okay, this, nothing has changed, but we'll... <laughs> Um, <laughs> all right. So thanks for um, going through all of that information, Zachary and Dana. So we want to take a pause. You just learned about the drought and the extreme heat kind of hazards, and there's more hazards that uh, Dana and, and Zachary will go through. But we want to hear from you what your experience has been with uh, drought and extreme heat, and particularly in an incorporated uh, Clark County. You know, do you see any impacts that are really significant here? What has your experience been or what have you seen in the environment or in communities? So just kind of open discussion. We'll go for five or so minutes on this topic and then we'll go into some of the other hazards. Um, and just, you know, raise your tent card if you have, uh, if you want to get in the queue and I see a couple of hands in the Zoom room. So I'll go to Don first. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, we live in the interface between the forest and the urban area and Many people in Clark County are close to trees. And when there's a wildfire and the wind blows the fir needles into your gut gutters, they're gonna set your house on fire. And so we were told to remove the trees from close to the house, but I'm thinking that's not gonna do us any good. And we've already had to evacuate once. We live in Southeast Clark County and uh, we had to evacuate uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, uh, so that's a wildfire risk and, and a smoke risk. Uh, don't know what to do about it. I think uh, basically I've, I'm reconciled to the fact that we may lose everything and it's maybe our fault for living out here in the woods. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Don, I appreciate that. And Anne? So uh, a couple of different things here from a different different expect um, experiences. Uh, the 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 summer of extreme heat in June uh, caused undue damage that, that is sort of underexplained, I think, in the previous uh, thing on, on local farmers um, who really lost just about everything to the extent that we lost vendors at the farmer's market uh, uh, for the season, and some have yet to recover. It's not necessarily the death of the, it, it's certainly the death of the crops itself. At a very, in that particular time, it was uh, a significant period of time in the development of certain berries, for example. Um, but it was also the influx of insects as a result of the extreme heat that damaged the crops that made them valuable uh, that did the damage as well. And I just would like to reiterate what Don said about the, the um, bad air from wildfires. Um, I'm not sure what we can do about it, but we, in fact, as a local business, as a farmer's market had to cancel uh, during that period of time, which I believe was in September when it was at its worst. So I, I, it, to me, uh, both the drought and the extreme heat, not to mention the unpredicted snowfall, maybe three or four years ago in April or whenever it was, about this time of year, it seems to me, which did undo damage on the berry season going forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for sharing. And I just want to note, too, that we do have wildfire and wildfire smoke as its own hazard that we're going to um, present on and discuss a little bit later. So I appreciate yeah. flagging those comments now, but we'll yeah. have more time for that. Um, I'll go to Jessica in the room and then Gabriella. Hi. Um, so I was concerned with water availability. So as we have more droughts and extreme heat in our summertime, there's a lot more demand for our water, for irrigation, and our own personal use. And then as Clark County is growing, there's more demand from people on a daily basis. But we may have less water available. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. And Gabriella? 
Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry I'm keeping my camera off because my internet is not very stable. Um, so the, the things that I notice, I serve the community that is very vulnerable with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And they live throughout the county. I have lived in Salmon Creek area, Salida, and now I live between the city of Vancouver and Canvas. And the things that I noticed with the uh, high heat is that people can't afford to have an AC unit to cool down in their homes. So they need to go and look for places to cool down. Children with intellectual and developmental disabilities are very susceptible to um, the high heat due to sensory issues. And also like when there's a fire, the smoke affects them um, with their, um, like if they have um, any asthma issues or any other sensory issues because um, they get headaches and things like that. So the cost of running an AC or even having an AC is quite high. And then if there are power outages, because so many people are jumping into the uh, using their AC units, and that's another issue where people cannot um, even have a fan to blow at home. So those are just a few of the things that I can share for now. But um, yeah, there are a lot of effects with the um, high weather uh, conditions and also the smoke. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella. Uh, let's go to Sunrise O'Mahony and then uh, Dave Rowe in the room. Okay, so for the county, for what I'm seeing through the work that I do um, is restoration work in the creeks and the streams in the county. We're having it's kind of a no brainer on this, but definitely the plant survivability is way less. So we're having a much higher die off rate on plant survivability. A lot of these locations, we don't have water access. So it's not something that we would be watering anyways. And so that makes it even more detrimental. So we're seeing an increase in erosion on the creeks because of the bank destabilization. And then of course that also we're seeing the increased temperatures on the creeks because again, we're not able to shade them. So it's, it's especially during that one, that real, real high heat. And um, there were certain areas that we normally would see, you know, we were seeing in the 80 percentile for survivability and we were lucky if we saw 50% and some of the areas in the entire sections just died off. That's all. Yeah, yeah this is Dave Rowe, uh, live up by Daybreak Park. And uh, it's the wind that I, I've lived there 20 years and we've never had the wind that we've had this past uh, year or so. Uh, last week at 11 o'clock at night, fence blew down and the neighbors lost some trees. I, I don't know if there's a freak wind or what that, that happened then. So I, I don't know if it's climate change caused by causes more wind, but it is concerning. Thanks for sharing, David. Um, let's go to Monica and then Andrea, and then I think we'll move into the next set of hazards to make sure we have time to get through all of them. Go ahead, Monica. Awesome, thank you. Um, so when the heat dome um, hit, um, it, it hit our, my family and my mental health uh, really bad. Um, it was just like, okay, what can we cook? Um, Cause then the stove is gonna make the whole house hot. Um, we have to put blankets up in between the hallway and the kitchen. Um, we have to stay inside and and just basically be like, okay, hopefully we're gonna be okay. And, and being concerned for all those that were outside that were not okay. Um, also um, uh, just over time, like I had to learn all the, uh, uh, like what I put in the chat about uh, rewilding our communities, but I didn't know that then. And so having that fear of like, what do we, what do we do? What do we do? And, um, and then the electricity bill was so high because of running an AC that, um, we could afford only because we got, um, our taxes and we're like, okay, we can do that. And so like, just being 
low income and all of the things of just, okay, how is my family going to be safe and not being able to go outside and and, and enjoy the day. Um, be like, sorry, but we like, sorry, I hadn't like, uh, we can't go outside because it's literally too hot. And so, and then feeling just the weight of, uh, okay, well, uh, what can we do inside and everything? And just, just the fear, overall fear and not knowing what to do. And so, yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing, Monica. And Andrea? Yeah, um, uh, so as a child, I had the unfortunate experience of being homeless. Um, so my biggest concern with drought and extreme heat would be the medical issues that that causes, whether it be um, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, et cetera. Um, and, and what people experiencing homelessness, uh, will, will be impacted, how they will be impacted. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's a very, it's life or death for a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, and so this is a huge concern for me. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate that. I guess one more in the room, Terry. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Drought and extreme heat have a serious and significant impact on the electrical grid. Um, the drought, drought conditions on the river, we're seeing uh, less power production through hydro on both the Snake and the Columbia River. Um, it's shifting the time that the snow melt occurs, so that's affecting us uh, here locally. Um, uh, but the grid infrastructure is pretty sensitive to those extreme heat days and it's very uh, unstable at those high temperatures, and if that <clears throat> occurs, then we have hospitals and schools and residents without electricity. Thank you, Terry. Okay, well, Dana and um, Jeremy, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. I'm sorry, Zachary, I'll hand it back over to you. All right. Thanks, everyone. That was such, such good feedback. Thank you for that. Um, Zachary, I'm going to move us on to our flooding slide here. There you go. Take it away. Everyone hearing me okay now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, now we move on to our next set. We're going to try not to get <clears throat> overwhelmed again. I apologize if the pace of this is pretty Pretty overwhelming, but yeah, really appreciate you hearing hearing you uh, share your stories. Um, so flooding, our next hazard of concern. The first thing we want to look up, look at. Uh, obviously, a, a primary driver is total annual precipitation, and so the thing that we're looking at here is a percent change in total annual precipitation, which you know we're looking at over the course of the entire year. So across the entire uh, unincorporated area, we're seeing an uptick of for 4.5 percent and then <clears throat> here on the map you'll see that there are no red values and that's because uh the data is spread across the entire state of washington um so we're seeing like like it says in the in the arrows like a moderate increase concentrated in the southern portion of the unincorporated area next slide All right, and then another uh, way to look at this, which is not um, the cell raster cell data, is the expected percent change in maximum stream flow um, over the next 30 years. And uh, here, you, you can see you'll be familiar with many of the water bodies here. Um, it's exclusive of the uh, Columbia uh, River uh, here, but you can see the the, the Lewis River and several other uh, the Washougal River um, down south. Um, but we're seeing generally like in in the in the middle of the unincorporated area, twelve percent, thirteen percent change, and this is uh, done by stream segment. These uh, estimations. Next slide, please. All right, and then the final type of flooding that we want to look at is flooding that could be caused by the Pacific Ocean in a high tide event, pushing water up the Columbia Basin and into the streams that would be adjacent to communities in the unincorporated area. So this is from uh, NOAA uh, or you know National National Weather Service data, and we're just looking at anticipated uh, outcomes of uh, an event like that. So this points, just like we'll see with wildfire and everything, to uh, non-local hazards having very localized effects. Next slide. 
All right. And then flooding, uh, like many of these hazards, it's intersected, but it affects everything. So as many of you could imagine, uh, the, the effect on agriculture, if you're flooding into a field um, from an adjacent water body, you're going to have crop loss. So not only are you continuing with extreme heat and early season heat and late season heat, but also um, inundation of fields. Um, buildings and energy, we're looking at uh, obstructed entrances, we're looking at damaged uh, residential buildings, um, lack of function to critical facilities. So where there is equipment um, to deal with various hazards, not even just flooding, um, we could see a, a limitation on Clark County's ability to uh, respond to those. Um, economic development, uh, if we see a major 500 year flood or high scenario flood, uh, we would expect to see a lot of debris. Um, we saw it even with the volcanic eruption and, and the sort of damming of the Columbia. Um, you can only imagine in a, in a worst case scenario how it might happen. Uh, ecosystems, when, when rivers take a lot of flow, uh, unexpected flow, we can have erosional events, which can lead to other hazards that we'll talk about later, such as landslides. Um, and then health and well-being, obviously there's a, there's a threat posed to, to people who are you know, out and about uh, in their homes as well, but waterborne disease, um, getting, getting swept in, in, in flood waters and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. All right. The next, uh, as Dana mentioned up top, um, we've split this category in the natural hazard mitigation plan into two types of extreme weather. And the first was extreme heat, and this is uh, seasonal storms as a hazard of concern. So we're mainly looking at these winter, winter time high precipitation events. Uh, and so we're looking at first a, a, the incidence of one inch precipitation days. Uh, and if you wouldn't be familiar with uh, what one inch looks like, I'm sure most of you have lived through a one inch uh, storm, but we can see standing water, you see puddles on the street. Um, if the storm is slow moving enough, you can see inundated stormwater facilities, um, so on and so forth. So what we're looking at over the next uh, 30 years in terms of the change of number of days uh, is to uh, about to 1.8 across the region and we're seeing a concentration of that hazard in the in the southeast portion of the unincorporated area and then did we do we have a question it looks like ann foster popped up on screen there maybe not i'll just proceed nope. as if Okay, wonderful. All right, and we'll look at it. We'll look at a different uh, metric in two flavors here. One is uh, heavy precipitation. One's extreme precipitation. So as I talked about with flooding before, we have these scenarios that we look to um, that are, you know, kind of a more regular expected occurrence versus the more uh, catastrophic, uh, you know, 500 year occurrence in the in the case of floods. So with storms, we look at a two year storm and then we're going to look at a 25 year storm and the two year storm. Um, we're looking at a 5% uh, uptick and we're seeing risk distributed fairly evenly um, considering throughout the unincorporated region. Next slide. And then here we'll look at extreme precipitation magnitude, 25 year storm, and then we're seeing an increase of 3% uh, region wide. And next slide, please. So as you could tell, uh, seasonal storms, these heavy precipitation events and flooding will be like highly interconnected. So while we may, may see stronger storms across all, all of the seasons, we're, we're mainly keeping an eye on the, those uh, winter, winter storms that could do uh, the most damage and have uh, heavy winds, which I think one of you mentioned already. Um, I know in the region, we saw a lot of felled trees, um, enormous impacts, interconnected impacts with uh, many other hazards. Um, and for transportation, obviously, we have a concern for roads and bridges being blocked uh, by debris um, that is displaced by storm winds uh, and storm waters. Uh, people are at risk from fallen limbs and and down trees as well. There's energy infrastructure questions, um, exposing people to you know high voltage uh, power lines, and then finally property damage from down trees. Okay. All right. 
we're keeping pace. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> landslide is our next uh, hazard of concern. And here, uh, what I've done um, is grab data from an earthquake study that was done by Dogami, which is an Oregon institution. But in fact, this was a regional effort um, done by RDPO, which is a regional disaster preparedness organization. So it, it includes the five county region, which includes Clark County. Um, so this study was done specifically and extended specifically beyond uh, the borders of Oregon using historical landslide data from Washington's uh, DNR and ecology. Uh, and right now we're just looking at the distribution of landslide susceptibility under wet conditions. So like I said before, we're all of these hy hydrological water-based uh, hazards uh, have a great impact on the slope stability and, and soil. Um, and so everywhere we're looking here, you know, those previous uh, stormwater and, and flooding sites would have a great impact on uh, the, the incidence of what we're looking at, which is like a shallow susceptibility uh, uh, prediction. Uh, so there's shallow and deep landslides, and here what we're looking at is those surficial level or the surface level uh, landslides. Next slide, please. And then landslides, obviously, if you live adjacent to one or on one, you understand the risks that they could have um, to your property. Uh, if, if there's a giant earth movement, um, obviously cause a lot of trouble on, on a property level. Um, from an ecosystem perspective, uh, losing hillside stability, um, having habitat damage for endangered species, um, emergency management. Uh, also, if transportation is affected, then it's going to be difficult to reach people who are in need of assistance. Um, and then buildings and energy, you know, damage to critical infrastructure uh, that, that we need to uh, be in good condition to stage a good response uh, in the county. Next slide, please. All right, I'll pass it back. Okay, hey, Sylvia, you want to take this one? All right, I'm going to try again. Can you hear me? Yes, it's still working. Good. Yes, it's still working. Good. Great. All right, so we're going to um, head into a discussion on flooding storms and landslides. So similar questions as we had for the drought and heat. Just want to hear from you all. Um, you know, have you experienced flooding, these seasonal storms and landslides, and what impacts have you particularly seen in unincorporated Clark County? You know, what really stands out for you as important locally? So I'll just open it up and look for raised hands and tent cards. Okay, going first to Noelle Laverne. I first have the question, um, seasonal storms. Are we also looking at like snowstorms or just rain events? We can definitely talk about snowstorms. Yeah, so if you have right. an experience well, of snowstorm to share, please do. So I I can't whine enough about the snowstorm that I got caught in <laughs> for hours. Um, and uh, just, yeah, it was really traumatic. So uh, it wasn't this year because I was smart, smart enough to stay home this year. Um, but last year, when I was new to the area, I it took me five hours to get from Vancouver to downtown Portland, where I had to actually like leave my car and walk for a mile in the dark in my heels <laughs> to find shelter with somebody I didn't really know that well. <laughs> so um, I, that would be my experience with that. So, and this year, my uh, I will add this year, my the snowstorm hit my kid's house. Um, it a massive tree fell on the townhouse unit next to them, so it impacted me because then they had to come stay with me for two weeks. So, <laughs> so anyway, it, yeah, those definitely have impact. Absolutely, thanks. That's probably never good to have. Maybe good to have your kids back for two weeks, but sounds like it was maybe a little too long. Um, the two kids, the dog, the cat, it was enough. <laughs> All right, let's go to Sunrise. 
So it's, I mean, it's echoing, I guess, what I kind of already said, but just to give more of a tangible example on the flooding. So um, G Creek, which is in Richfield and um, in unincorporated and into, into the city of Richfield, it's always been a very flashy creek. So it's definitely has flooding every year. That's not new to have it not, you know, not flood, but it is getting more and it is increasing. It's a variety of reasons. It's not just climate. It's also looking at development. However, it is increasing. So one of the properties that we were doing restoration on this, just this last storm we just had recently, they lost probably about 60 feet, linear feet by maybe about six feet or so of their bank just collapsed into, you know, into the creek. So we're seeing that happen where every year we expect to see easily about two feet of loss on the creek on the erosion side of it and it has a lot to do with again the flooding it has to do with the planting but also just the level of water that's coming in and the intensity when we had that big rainstorm recently and then all the snow and the ice that just increased it exponentially and it was a challenge so those you know that that homeowner lost a very good portion of their property from that storm all right thanks for sharing sunrise uh, let's go to Gabriella and then Jessica in the room. Thank you. Um, yes, I want to share what I've seen with the uh, seasonal storms, like when there's flooding. Um, if the drainage in the street is not working or it puddles, the water puddles, um, cars can really uh, stop running <laughs> if they are too low. And I know because my car is um, it's not electric, but it's one of those little cars that are very high fuel efficiency. And um, it stops working when some of those puddles are too high. And um, with the snowstorms, uh, we see the main streets uh, clean, most of them, but uh, the neighborhood streets are not clean so they are very hey, hard to navigate and for people to even go to the store and buy supplies like in the last uh, snowstorm I had families stuck at home for like an entire week because they didn't feel comfortable uh, driving in the snow which I think is the smart thing to do because with the weather conditions and if they don't know how to drive in the snow it's better not to drive uh, in those conditions but then they were out of uh, food supplies for their families. So uh, those are the things that um, I wanted to share. Thank you. Thanks, Gabriella. And Jessica? I had a question to start out with. Oh, what's the difference between the, oh, what's the difference between a um, two-year storm and a 25-year storm? Did you hear that question, Dana? It's what's the difference between a two-year and uh, a five-year storm? It was 25 on the slide. Oh, sorry, 25. 25-year storm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, yeah. I, oh, sorry. I, 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 there's a little bit of an echo in the room. There's a little bit of an echo in the room. Okay. I'll, I'll proceed and try anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the incident of a two-year storm, it's a, it's a storm that we would expect to see, like, Every two years, um, w within a within a return interval. So we're um, maybe that's too technical. So the chance that every two years uh, uh, a storm like this would happen is, is represented in the in the figure that you were seeing, right? So it's like for every year over the next thirty years, what is the percent chance that this uh, two-year storm, which is a storm of less magnitude, would happen uh, on on any day uh, in that it, on any day in that year, right? And then 25-year, which just indicates more uh, more volume of precipitation, um, we're just ex expect to see that level of storm every 25 years, and so we're representing that probability um, year over year, like, and that, that's what the maps are showing. Is that, is that helpful at all? I guess I was looking for a kind of value. So like the first slide, it was greater than one inch. So would a two-year storm be rainfall in a like a 24-hour period of three inches? I'm just trying to get some. 
like perspective no, on what you consider a no. two-year storm? So it's regionally regionally dependent. You would say you would measure the normal. So so the historical normal in this case is. 1980 to 2010, and we take that number 2009 actually to be accurate. Um, and then we say like, what is what is what does a storm look like? What does a two-year storm look like in that period? And then we pair, compare that against the period that we're looking at. Um, hopefully that is helpful. <laughs> Just to maybe to answer Jessica's question, I, we don't have. Maybe we could dig up this information. We don't have it handy. Like, what is the volume of rainfall of a two-year storm in Clark County? Um, mm -hmm. It's more a relative measure of this. This kind of storm is likely to occur about every two years, as opposed to this kind of storm is likely to occur about every 25 years. So the 25-year storm is more intense and more rare if that's helpful, compared to the two-year storm, which is um, a more regular occurrence. But we don't have specific inch values associated with that. Thank you. I guess I was looking for, I guess, kind of a definition. Um, and the reason is, so um, I live in unincorporated Clark County, and we manage our own stormwater. So our stormwater doesn't go into the street and into a stormwater system. We manage our own. So I'm always stressed out when the atmospheric rivers come through. I'm like, mm -hmm. how much rain are we going to get? Mm -hmm. Right? Are we going to have flooding or is groundwater going to rise and then cause issues in the cross spaces? We worry. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, let's go to Brent in the room. OK, I may have some input on this with my personal experience of a lifelong uh, resident of Clark County and someone who is out working in the forest 365 days a year, literally every day, I have noticed that there's a much greater frequency of serious storms in recent years. I can remember that, you know, there used to be a, a serious ice storm or heavy snowstorm or windstorm, which, you know, destroys trees, blocks roads, uh, interrupts electricity, uh, destroys fences in my case, because I have spent a lot of time fixing fences. This would happen every five years or so, and then I'd have to clean everything up, and then it happened again in five years. Now, it can happen two or three times in the same winter. Now, there can be a serious storm one week and wreck all my fences, and even before I fix them, there's another storm that wrecks the other fences. So, and I will say this about snow, snow in April, uh, I think it's been mentioned there was a heavy snowstorm a couple of years ago in April. Um, in my experience in the last 50 years, it snowed in April up until recently, maybe once every five or 10 years maybe. Last April at my place, it snowed 10 days up to two inches each time. This is April. So this is, I think this is pretty strong evidence for climate change. And so these, however you measure the seriousness of these storms, anecdotally, they're happening much more often. All right, thank you, Brent, appreciate that. All right, well, thank you for that great discussion. And we have one more set of hazards, um, and then we can kind of do a collective conversation and then get into uh, talking about community assets. So I'll hand it back over to go through the last set of hazards. All right, thanks so much. Uh, so finally, yeah, we're, we're looking at a wildfire as a hazard of concern and then wildfire danger, which is represented as the change in number of high fire danger days. And then regionally, uh, across the region, we're seeing uh, plus, plus five days, so five more days um, <clears throat> over the next uh, 30 years in an in increase in, in high fire danger days. And so if we look at that uh, in terms of the map, Going from lower to higher, we see a concentration in the the, the lower northwest uh, quadrant there, and then 
you'll see in the next slide, uh, when, when you look at this on a state level, um, you'll see a fairly obvious pattern towards uh, forested areas. Next slide. And then here, whereas before we were looking at likelihood of higher fire danger days, we're, we're just seeing the likelihood of wildfire here. So you, you see a map of the state of Washington on your left here, and you can you can fairly easily trace uh, the, the Cascade um, Forest and the mountains, and you can see um, areas where there's very low risk. And if you look at the entire area, you see it's quite low in Clark County, um, but that doesn't mean that it can't be affected by a smoke events that are caused by the, these wildfire events, right? So if we had a year like we had in 2020, 2021, um, th then we could see that, again, the traveling, just like we saw a sea level rise um, of hazards across uh, administrative boundaries and county lines. Um, so looking at the impacts of wildfire smoke, damaging to human health, obviously PM 2.5 um, can infiltrate the lungs and cause a number of health conditions. Um, and asthma, cardiovascular disease, there, there are many groups that are like inherently at risk. Um, we're looking at the elderly, young people, people that aren't able to um, house themselves, right, at the houseless community. Um, and then wildfire smoke is often, depending on where it's burning and what uh, sites it's adjacent to, is known to contain, contain cancer-causing chemicals or carcinogens. And that's about it for wildfire impacts. All right, there we go. <laughs> we, we went to the, the burning side. That's totally fine. Um, and yeah, obviously the, the risk of fire, though many areas in Clark County aren't directly exposed to it. Uh, if you have buildings adjacent to it, you're going to see a lot of property destruction. Um, water resources, interestingly, as um, sto slopes around reservoirs are destabilized, uh, if you get too much sediment in those water bodies, then the water becomes undrinkable, uh, a lot difficult, more difficult to filter, and it can compromise like a water supply. Um, and then obviously the, the direct injury from, from fire exposure that uh, communities that are not prepared uh, may face. Uh, next slide. All right, we're back to, <laughs> that was a quick turnaround for discussion and reflection, but we, we heard a few impacts early on, but I'll, I'll pass it back Great, thank you, Zachary. Right, we did hear a few comments on um, wildfire and smoke earlier, but just want to hear more if folks have experienced this and you know, what you see as some of the specific impacts locally. Uh, Brent, you have your card up. I will just mention uh, stress. That uh, personally, I'm scared of fires, and I don't like it when they get close, but also. I've noticed in particular, because I have run an animal sanctuary, animals get really stressed out by smoke. And um, I, I think stress, we all know that stress really affects health. So this is perhaps an indirect or, or a difficult to measure uh, thing, but you know, when we get stressed out, this, this affects us. And you know, the domestic and wild animals you know, they cannot escape. So I'm just mentioning the, the effect of stress that I have seen myself. Thank you, Brent. And Monica? Thank you, yes. Just wanted to, to the comment that I left in the chat. Um, like education, um, I don't know how to figure this out. It was like uh, raking our forest actually it up to sunlight is the soil reducing this complex nutrients allows us to grow stronger and healthier and wearing the brush sorry monica we're only able to hear every other word that you're saying for some reason Maybe. but we do see your comment in the chat awesome do you want to say anything more on that oh it'll yeah the, the chat comment is is good um but yeah um, yeah more education and how we can help um, with these wires. Uh, so thank you. All right, got it. More education when it comes to these wildfires. Thank you, Monica. All right, others, any other um, comments, thoughts on wildfire and smoke impacts? Yeah, Janet. 
Um, so when we um, talk about the business community, when we're looking at the wildlife, that is a big concern. One of the things that we field a lot of questions on is really the um, on the unincorporated side, the policies um, or um, the allowance of fireworks when looked at in conjunction with the, the wildfire season. So um, we, there's not um, two days that go by in July that we don't field a lot of emails and concerns uh, from the business community uh, regarding regarding fireworks when um, the heat is at its highest in the summertime. A lot of fear. Uh, thanks, Janet. Others? All right. I think we had one more question um, for the hazards. Is it on the next slide? Okay. Um, we also just wanted to see, is there anything missing from the list of hazards? So we talked about drought, extreme heat, flooding, storms, landslides, wildfire and smoke. Um, and I don't know, Dana, if you want to expand on this um, or Zachary to give a little bit more context, but um, we just wanted to make sure that we have a complete list of hazards. So is there anything else you want to add to that, Dana? No, that was good, Sylvia. Just, yeah, these are the hazards that we just shared with you all. So, um, you know, we were pulling from what's in the Nat Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan and then just some other um, hazards that we're aware of affecting the region. But if anyone has thought of anything that you wish you were seeing on here and you're not, uh, we're just opening it up for some suggestions there. Give folks a few seconds if you see anything missing. Yeah, Jessica? Didn't know if you wanted to add extreme cold because we had oh you have extreme heat but we've had several uh, storms in the past where we had numerous days where it was down below freezing um, and so the soil level freezes pretty low with busted pipes and sheltering people for longer than normal periods of time maybe adding something around extreme cold. Yes, got it. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to have a yeah, chat yeah, about that internally soon. So uh, thanks for that. Anything else you feel like it's missing here? I don't see any hands up or tent cards, so might be able to Great. move on. Great. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Um, we are done with the projections and impacts conversation. So, oh, I did wanna just open it up for any uh, general questions. I know we've, you know, we kind of interrupted the hazards presentation there for our reflections and discussions, but if any, if you had any questions about the maps or the methods or the data sources or anything like that, any questions at all, we can spend a moment for those if anyone has any. Yeah. If anyone has any. Yeah, we have a question in the room from Justin Wood. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, just had a question about kind of the University of Washington map um, and associated data. Is that what other, in your experience, I guess, is that what other counties in the state of Washington are using that, that need to kind of accomplish this work as well? Yeah, so that tool was specifically called for by the Department of Commerce guidance for this um, this legislation and to fulfill these requirements. So we were specifically directed to that tool, at least as a starting point, and that is where we got the majority of our data that we presented today. Um, but then we're also kind of pulling from other sources to try to fill in some gaps. But yeah, uh, we were specifically directed toward that tool and others in Washington trying to meet the requirements of the legislation will be doing the same. All right, thank you. Others, any other questions? Okay, well, that was a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I think we have one more. And I'm Foster. sorry, it was real quick, the last minute here. Um, it's, it's, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but are the slides that you presented, are they available to us? 
Yes, they're not currently available, but they will be sent out shortly after the meeting. So you will okay. have access to these. Okay, great, great, because it's great homework study. Yeah. Kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Those and of us have... that don't deal with this every day, it's great to have these to 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 sort of uh, you know, evolve with over the course of the next week. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's um, the URL is on one of the slides for the um, the tool. So if, if anyone wants to go and explore the tool yourself, you know, themselves and interact with the data, we highly recommend that too. And pretty yeah. fun to click around in there. Right, right, right. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? Okay. I don't see wow. any hands up in the room wow. either. Yeah, go ahead, Dana. All right. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing then, Sylvia, if you want to pivot to the assets activity. All right. So we have one more substantive topic for today, which is this community assets list. Um, and, I, and maybe, Dana, do you just want to say a few words about kind of what this list is and how it's going to be used and we'll flash it up on the screen here and then I'll explain what we're going to do. Yes, sure thing. And so this is the next slide, sure please. Thing. So Yeah, so this is that community assets list that I previewed earlier. Um, those in the room, I think are going to get a printout of this. And there's also a link that Maria just put in the chat for those who are online. You can um, see this in a Google Doc so you can read it a little more easily. But um, basically, we're trying for this like data gathering context setting portion of the work, we're trying to get a sense of what are the community assets, like what are the services and places and resources that people value that could be impacted by climate change. So um, the next step in our process is to take the list of assets and take the list of hazards and start to pair them together and talk Sort, sort out what are the impacts that might happen when this hazard meets this asset. So that's where we're headed next with this work. And before we do that, we just wanna make sure that we have a comprehensive list of assets here. And also that there's nothing on the asset list that doesn't really make sense for unincorporated Clark County. So uh, what we're asking you all to do is just spend a little time reviewing the list that we have here and let us know if you see anything that should not be on the list. Um, maybe because it doesn't actually exist in unincorporated Clark County. Uh, and also if you feel like anything's missing that you would like to see added to this list. And we're keeping these at a pretty high level for the moment. So for example, we're talking about hospitals as a, a general asset type rather than a specific hospital. So I think that about covers it. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Dana. Appreciate that. And so for this activity, we're actually just going to give you all a little bit of quiet time because we know it's a lot to read. And just look. And so if you're in the room, we have it printed and you can just read through the assets and ask yourself, is anything missing? Should anything not be here? Those are really the two questions. And you have some sticky notes in front of you so you can actually jot down your ideas. And we have some flip chart pages that we could put your um, your ideas on on what's missing or maybe what shouldn't be here. And if you're in the Zoom room, just go ahead and put your comments in the chat and make sure that you select chat to everyone so that we can all see it. And just, you know, you can put in like missing dot 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 or whatever the thing is or, you know, don't include this asset because it doesn't actually exist in the county. So we'll just give you a little bit of time to um, do that kind of maybe five minutes here and then we'll open it up for discussion. Are there any questions on, on what we're doing here? Yeah, Anne? Uh, so while we're doing this, um, maybe what you could do is expand a little bit and using an example from the, from the grid here, from the table, the concept of asset, how you've defined it, asset themes versus asset types. Sure, yeah. So the different columns are just a way to kind of help sort it into a few extra categories to make it easier to work with, but I'll actually start with the sectors column. So just a reminder of what I mentioned earlier, the Department of Commerce guidance for this work provided us with these 11 sectors that you see listed here. So 
within each of those sectors, we have asset themes, which are sort of like the next tier of assets. Um, so that, they're, okay. They're the really high. Tier. All right. Yeah. So they're, they're just really high level. So food production is a theme, but a specific okay. asset on that theme would be a community garden or a farm. So an asset type is sort of a discrete, specific kind of location or service or population. Okay. Is that so helpful? If, there, if we see, so t taking the example of agriculture and food systems and Sometimes I think those should be separated out because there are two different assets. But um, if I'm understanding assets correctly, um, if there are more asset themes than in a sector, do you want that feedback as well? Sure. Or are you oh, yeah. are you pretty are you pretty stuck because of the guidelines and you know be candid in your response here if you don't have a whole lot of flexibility with where you can go um but no. i'm thinking if i'm using the example once again of agriculture and food systems and once again thinking they should be that to me those are two there are two themes within that sector mm -hmm. um, sure yeah so and i see uh well buildings and energy uh, although that's not my native industry, but it seems to me that there certainly would be other themes within buildings and energy in addition to these two within unincorporated Clark County. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to grasp what the, the definition of asset theme versus asset type and how it fits into sectors. That's Yes. So to answer one of the questions, I, I have no flexibility on sectors. So those okay. have to stay as they okay. are. But we no. Yeah, we definitely okay. have flexibility on asset themes and asset types. So um, definitely open to suggestions on either. I think we're mainly looking for asset types at this point. However, if you do have ideas for asset themes that you feel like are really missing, we can certainly take that feedback. Okay, and, okay. And, and that I should put in a chat or in an email. What's the best way to communicate that? Yeah, well, you can put it. Do we have a Jamboard set up? Well, we're asking folks to just put it in the chat, but if you wanna think about it and you have a longer idea, please email it. And okay, um, we'll you do. can email that to okay, Jenna Kay. We'll to Jenna. Okay, got it. Yeah, and maybe, sorry to interrupt. Right, so we'll maybe start here. Here. One, one additional thing to note is the, the asset types are the ones that we're eventually going to pair with a hazard. So those are the those are the ones that we're really going to look more closely at. So the asset themes are important, but they're more of um, just an organizational aid or just kind of adding an extra layer to um, okay. help you like sort them out as you look through them. But the asset types are the ones that we're going to say for um, just using the first line there as an example, when commercial farms meet wildfire, what happens? Or okay. um, when so hospitals can, meet Can flooding. we add to the list then of asset um, types in a given sector? Yes, yes, please do. That's that's one of our big asks now is if you feel like anything's really missing from the asset types. Okay. We welcome input on that to make sure we're not missing okay. anything major. All right. So All right. I have the reflexes with laptop zoom. Um, so let's do a few minutes on this, maybe until 7.04, and then folks in the room, too, if you need to get up and stretch, that's fine, and then we'll uh, have a few more minutes of conversation on it.
I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. What assets do we have for um, water quality to know the, the water that we're drinking, what's in it? I know we get a report about water quality, but um, how good is it or how confident are we that that's working properly or that we don't need to make it better? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think um, maybe for a little clarification, if we're thinking about drinking water, drinking water would be the asset. Mm -hmm. And then looking at maybe pollutants in the water would be an impact that we might get at later. So if there's runoff into a drinking water source that could make the water quality worse, um, we might look at that as an impact. But the drinking water would be the asset. Okay, thank you. Do I don't see it here? Yeah, that's why I was thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. If it's, I think you're right. It's not on here. So yeah, let's get that on there for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think the drinking water is under aquifers, under water resources. Yeah, I think that that is true. That's we can make it a little more explicit and actually say drinking water in aquifers or in surface waters. You could add maybe just say aquifers slash well. And that covers public and private. Got it. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that we're about wrapping up. Um, there's so many good comments in the chat here and a ton of sticky notes up in the room that folks can't see of additional um, assets to add under several of the sectors. So I'll just, you know, open up to see if folks, you know, we don't have to go through every comment, but if there's just a few, if people want to say something in specific about the um, assets that they identified as missing or just, you know, any general comments that folks want to make or highlight. Yeah, Brent. Well, I will just mention uh, under uh, local businesses, I think restaurants are very significant, particularly when there's any sort of a real disruption from all these things that can happen, restaurants often serve as an alternative uh, food source for people that are otherwise affected by these things. And also as you know, kind of a form of a community center. So if restaurants can stay open, good for business, but also good for the community. Brent and Justin. I just wanted to say I agree with Brent. Um, also under local businesses, outfitters. So that would be people who take people out to fish, hunt, and foraging um, as well. So thank you. All right, thank you.
Others, anyone else want to highlight important assets or just expand on anything that you put in writing? Right. Well, Dana, I'll ask you anything, any other questions you have for the group or anything else you wanted to hear? No, I think this is great. I'm seeing a lot of good ideas in the chat. And thank you all so much again for your input today. This has been so helpful. Yeah, perfect. And we'll consolidate all of this so that, you know, this won't just live in sticky notes and Zoom chats. <laughs> It'll go somewhere. Um, great. Oh, and um, Don, I see your hand up too. Uh, yeah, I just, I just thought of uh, one more thing. But regarding energy resources, you can put in a solar farm east of the Cascades, but we can't get the electricity here because we need transmission lines. And in a very hot day, the wires don't carry as much as they might on, on other days. Uh, and so having uh, solar everywhere in Clark County, on every parking lot, on all the BPA lines, on all, every brownfield is, has to be done, uh, and it can't be done soon enough because we have increasing demand and we have no other alternatives. Uh, you could say solar and wind on east of Cascades, but there's no way to get it here. And the PUD and BPA, BPA says we're gonna be able to supply it, but uh, uh, I don't wanna trust them because there's a lot of opposition to solar and wind on the east side of the Cascades. Uh, so that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Don. Right. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to get into our public comment period. Thank you everyone for all the great comments and ideas on the community assets and on the hazards conversation. Although maybe we have one more comment. Um, Monica, did you have something else to add? I did, and it was about the, uh, um, regarding the vision that I just wanted to, uh, quick comment. Um, it's um, maybe adding to, to like shorten it um, a little bit is adding human prosperity and a flourishing life um, because we can't um, uh, never underestimate the power of visual framing and also framing um, what we draw and what we determines what we can and, and what we notice and what we ignore. We notice and what we ignore. That's all. Great. Thank, thank you, Monica. And we were able to hear just a little bit of what you said, but it sounded like you had a short way of stating a vision statement. So maybe if you could um, put that in writing, or if you already put it in the chat, then we have it there. But thank you. I'm sorry. It's just your No, for sure. Thank out. you. I'm sorry. It's, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It's great to have. I'm sorry. It's great to have. Perfect. Okay. Great. All right, well, let's move into our public comment period now. So if you'll go to the public comment slide, please, Maria. Um, and if you are a member of the public, we ask you that you just raise your hand in the platform right now. We don't have any members of the public in the room uh, for those that can't see. So I see two hands up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna call your name when it's time for your comment. And we're doing about two minutes a person. Um, so we'll just ask that you say your name, you know, make a comment that's uh, two minutes. And the it, comments that are based on what we talked about today as a community advisory group are what's most helpful for the process at this time. So, you know, sticking to that is, is always helpful. Um, and of course, we just ask you to use the, the good, uh, you know, to stay respectful, focus on substance kind of um, comments. And so I actually I see three hands up now from Tina, Richard, and Jean. And so I'll just call your name in order and we'll go about two minutes apiece. Oh, and when you get a message on your screen that says unmute, just go ahead and press unmute. So let's go to Tina first. Hi there, um, I'm Tina Barrows. And I just want to very briefly um, kind of back up and say good job everyone um, on the vision statement. I think it has all the important points in it. And the two most important things that stood out for me that I want to make sure that they aren't just forgotten or left behind is that one, one person said that it's important to not just work on adaptation, but on mitigation as well. And then the other point was, and I think Don made that, that um, 
you make sure that there's clear timed goals and that we stay on track of those. So, yep, that's just my two cents worth. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Let's go to Richard and then we'll go to Jean. Richard? Okay, uh, my name is Richard Colber and I have a few comments. Um, related today, uh, fires often uh, lead to landslides by burning away the the what anchors the soil to the to the hill. Um, also, they tend to have temperature extremes uh, when we have climate change. It, it's getting worse. Um, I don't know if the county is planning on developing a climate action plan, but they might look at um, the County of Santa Clara Office of Stateability's Community Climate Roadmap 2035. Uh, Santa Clara County, California uh, has uh, is very much like Clark County in the variety of uh, both uh, rural and urban. And I don't know if you have, have been in contact with Sarah Fox, but I had a brief conversation and she is very willing to help uh, any local or county that would like to have the uh, Department of Commerce helping providing your help. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And next, let's go to Jean, and then I believe we have Donald as well. I'm Jean Avery. I hope you can hear me. We can. Shall I continue? Yep, we can hear you great. Great, thank you. Thank you for this extremely thorough analysis and study, and thank you for the public comment. I've been listening with, with my main interest, and I would like to see that elevated more to the vision statement and that high level. What is my main interest? My, my main concern is natural areas, trees, habitat for birds, fish, other wildlife, and the encroaching development in Clark County, which will jeopardize all of those. In some of the slides, there are there is mention of, of ecosystems, biodiversity, and the impacts on those. But I would like to see more emphasis on uh, protecting our trees. They sequester carbon, as you know, they reduce heat. There's a lot of talk in Vancouver about tree canopy. There's a Washington state health disparities map, which connects um, health concerns with tree canopy. Trees can mitigate landslides and on and on. I think we need to be more concerned about the natural habitat as I look at the vision statement, there are so many things that we're addressing for the human communities. And I really would like to elevate the trees and the natural habitat as well. So one example is in bullet number five, we want to be stewards of land and natural resources and protectors of trees and habitats for birds, fish, and other wildlife. So those are my thoughts and, and thank you so very much. Oh, zoning is a, another factor, by the way. Zoning and development. I know those words came up in subsequent slides, but and assets to me would be hiking trails. So several ideas. I would hope to see those incorporated at a higher level with more emphasis. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Jean. Appreciate that. And Donald, did you have a comment? Hi, this is Donald Augustin. 
Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. I only had one uh, thought early on in, in your presentation tonight, and that was that the committee doesn't seem to have any verbiage in it that we will hold polluters accountable for their actions or inactions. And I would really like to see people who disobey the law pay a price for that. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Donald. All right. Well, thanks to the members of the public that stuck with us for this meeting, and I really appreciate your comments today. Um, and with that, we can move into our next steps and um, give your the rest of your evening back, or what's left of it. <laughs> we went well into the night tonight. Okay, so wrap up the next steps. If we go to the next slide. Um, just a few pieces of homework and next steps. Just a reminder to complete that Open Public Meetings Act training. And uh, if you are interested in a stipend for attending the CAG meetings, just please do send in your stipend form to Jenna by Friday, March 15th. And you should have that in multiple emails that have been sent to you. But if you don't have it, we can get it to you again. <laughs> Um, and then next slide is just uh, reminders about our next meeting. Our next meeting is on Wednesday, April 24th at 5.30. And so um, fourth Wednesdays is now going to be our cadence for these community advisory group meetings. Today was not a fourth Wednesday, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> um, but going forward, <laughs> it feels like it, doesn't it? <laughs> It feels like March just started and is also over. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see you April 24th. So we have a little bit more time between our meetings this time around. And um, if you need any more information, of course, there's the website where you can get um, past materials. And for folks that were not able to make it to the meeting today, that's where you would find the meeting recordings and packets. And if you have any questions, just feel free to contact Jenna. Um, and then do we have one more slide? Okay, um, at our next meeting, the topics that we have planned are to talk about the revised vision statement and to continue the conversation on the resilience sub-element. Um, and you should also be getting an update on the equity lens and some of the engagement that's happening with this process. Um, and, and you know, before we get to the next meeting, if you do have any other comments on the vision statement or on the community assets list, Please, you know, send those in by email. Well, happy to hear those. We got so much great feedback today, so don't feel obligated to to do go above and beyond. But if you know something occurs to you, just just do send an email. Anything else, Jenna? I just want to thank everyone. We know these are late in the evening and long meetings, so really appreciate your your time uh, and presence. And thank you for your patience with our tech issues both in the room with no screen and for those of you online bearing with our sound issues. So really, really appreciate your patience and grace with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.